Hi everyone and uh, thank you for attending. I'll be talking about domain driven design and um, I'll try to advise you on how to avoid the traps that I walked right into when I got started with it. For this we'll follow a project of uh, the Baltimore Gun Club. It's a society that was created by the best gunners and ballisticians in the world during the American Civil War in the relentless pursuit of bigger and deadlier cannon. When the dreaded peace finally come in 1865, the society is left without a purpose. With no one left to fire at, they need to find a new target. So they decide to aim for the moon, literally. They team up with astronomers to build a cannon that is capable of sending a projectile straight to the moon. So hopefully the artillery and its need for always more complex ballistic computation already gave birth to some kind of uh, steampunk computers, such as this one. And uh, you're part of a team of early software craftsmen, and you will be tasked in creating the simulation software that will allow this feat. The simulation should allow the ballisticians, the gunners, and the astronomer to compute the right time for firing and the right cannon design in order to reach the moon. For this task of unprecedented complexity, you decide on using domain-driven design to keep the complexity under control. I will guide you through this. My name is Josian Chevalier. I work at Shadow. I'm a software craftsman at a French consultancy company that specializes in domain-driven design and software craftsmanship. So as you could guess, neither the Baltimore Gun Club nor early steampunk computers have existed. But this simulation will be the domain that we will be exploring today. <coughs> so before we start and get to the implementation, Let's uh, discuss a bit the main components of domain-driven design. So what is domain-driven design? It is not a framework. It is not a coding technique. It's a philosophy that is supported by a toolbox, by a set of patterns and practices that are each adapted to given sp uh, situations. The purpose is to create useful and explicit models that solve business problems. So a model is an abstraction of domain knowledge. Every software has a model at their core, whether it's explicit or not. This is how they represent the business that they will work with. It does this by keeping the technical efforts focused on the business needs and the interests of the software development team align with the interest of the business. So DDD is composed of strategic and tactical patterns. So this comes obviously from the warfare terminology. In warfare, the strategy defines the objectives, and the tactics is how we will reach these objectives. So in domain-driven design, we use this terminology as a metaphor for software development. What we call strategy is a large-scale design. It's what helps us decide on what we will spend our resources and our efforts on, and to define which problems we will try to solve. The tactics are the tools that we will use to implement the decisions we take during the strategic design. The tactics are much closer to the code. This is where we implement the model. And this is where all the buzzwords that you keep hearing about domain-driven design exist. Everything regarding aggregates, value objects, entities, domain events, hexagonal architecture, all this is tactical patterns. So usually when we get into domain-driven design, we get started with the tactical patterns because we come to DDD because we have pains in the code. So obviously we try to find code solutions. And the clean code aspect of domain-driven design is in the tactical patterns. Sun Tzu says in The Art of War, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. <laughs> 
The reason I'm quoting Sun Tzu is because this type of quote works extremely well to convince your manager and your C-level executive to let you do some um, large-scale design. But it's not wrong, either. In warfare, if you have tactics without strategy, you will be fighting the wrong battles. And at best, it's just a waste of resources for uncertain gains. It's the same in domain-driven design. Tactics without strategy will have you focus your efforts on the wrong things. So strategic design is the what. What do you want to do? What is the context that you're doing it within? The tactical patterns are the how. Which tools you will use for this purpose? And obviously, it's much easier to understand the how if you understand what you're trying to accomplish. Fighting the wrong battle in domain-driven design happen if you do tactics without strategy. You will focus on the wrong part in your system. You will focus on trying to understanding tools without trying to understand what you're trying to do. And obviously, it will be a huge waste of efforts. We like to think of ourselves as software craftsmen, but we have to think of what regular craftsmen do. And they use tools for a given purpose. A craftsman doesn't use a hammer and a nail because it's hype, or because it's cool, or because it's new and fun. They use them because they have specific constraints in the fixation. This is what we must do with the pattern. We must understand what we're trying to accomplish before we decide on which tool we use. And only there, only at this point, will we understand how to use this tool correctly. So in my opinion, the strategic design is the easy way into domain-driven design because it will offer great return on investment on your efforts, and this pretty quickly. So now that we have a um, good understanding of what is DDD comprised of and where we want to start, first we'll try to start implementing our simulation and discover the power of language. So as we start developing, we start talking with domain experts, we start reading specifications, and here are a few examples of the sentences that we hear and read. The gunpowder releases expanding gas, projectiles a cannonball out of the barrel. When ignited, the combustible stacked in the chamber at the end of the bore will eject the projectile placed above. The effect of the explosives on the shell depends on its shape. There are way too many words to designate the same concept or similar concept. This is honestly confusing for anybody that is not very used to this domain, and it makes the communication extremely painful. For example, here we use combustible and gunpowder completely interchangeably, even though it doesn't really mean the same thing. So, we take this um, as it is, and we start developing using these terms. After a while, a new, um, a new software developer in our team comes to see us with a code problem. He's trying to call a function that needs a gunpowder amount, and what he has is a combustible. So obviously, because gunpowder is a subset of combustible, he's trying to figure out how to get the amount of gunpowder from the combustible. And here it's just the same thing. He should be passing the entire combustible. But you can't know it by reading this code. So it, added, it uh, adds cognitive load when you're programming. And it adds real friction when communicating because you need back and forth to go back and understand your code. These are duplicate concepts. Duplicate concepts are when multiple terms designate the same concept. So let's take our sentences back, and let's identify the duplicate concept. So here, gunpowder, combustible, and explosive mean exactly the same thing for us. Cannonball, projectile, shell as well, barrel and bore, interchangeably as well, and only chamber was used alone. There are hints in the language that we choose to use. The fact that we talk of combustible and gunpowder shows us something implicitly. And when we talk with the domain experts, 
we have to try to make the implicit explicit. What should be explicit here is the fact that we will not always use gunpowder. At some point, we will attempt to use other combustible to find the most uh, efficient one. And to understand this, only communication will allow us to make it explicit and avoid having our code too tightly coupled with the notion of combustible, uh, with the notion of gunpowder. So we agree on the terms that we will use, to be precise, and we represent them on uh, this model over there. We talk of a Columbia instead of cannon because this is a subtype of cannon that we will use. We talk of bore, projectile, chamber, and combustible. Our language became our model. This is the abstraction of domain knowledge that we will use. The terms we have in here are the ones we're going to use in all of our communication. When we talk, in the diagrams, in the specs, and more importantly, in the code. Because they are everywhere, we talk of a ubiquitous language, a language that is everywhere. It's uh, worth noting as well that this model is highly simplified. If you give a schema like this to a gunner and ask him to operate a Columbiad, he will not be able to do so, much less to build one. But here our problem is trying to compute the amount of combustible we need to eject our projectile. We don't care about stabilization system, we don't care about any of this. So we don't want a model that is accurate, we don't want something very detailed, we want something that is useful for the problem we have at hand. Accurate is complex, it's difficult to implement, it takes way too much effort. Useful can be simple and pragmatic. So as we decided on our model, now we'll use tactical patterns to try and isolate it in a business logic layer. It doesn't matter truly which tactical pattern we use. We can use hexagonal architecture, we can use um, layers, etc. Or we can just simply isolate it in a corner and not really mine how we will call that. But what matters is that we isolate it from the complexity that is linked to given technologies and technique. And almost every software developer I've seen getting started with DDD has encountered this problem at some point. Does this code belong with the business logic? Here, for example, we have a code that will allow us to move an item in coordinates in the 3D space of our simulation. So technically, it's some kind of business logic. We are implementing it. It's not linked to a technology. So if you read the textbook definition of your tactical patterns, it will tell you just to isolate your model from the code linked to given techniques. And it's not linked to any of them. So we decide, why not leaving it in the business layer? So we go on. We implement our model using this type of code inside. But what we need to understand is that as a language became our model, eventually it goes both ways. As the model evolves, the language will change. Here we've left concepts linked to 3D spaces of our simulator in our model. Developers will use them. Developers will talk in terms of coordinates. Eventually, this will go on, contaminate the language of the domain experts. And one day, you hear a gunner that comes around and say, hey, bring the projectile at coordinate 50, 650, and 50, instead of lower the projectile down the board. This is when you know that you failed. If the language of the domain is not clear, if it's not explicit, the technique will pervade your model. And eventually, it will propagate to the language. You will have domain experts, product owner and such, talking of technical artifacts, talking of databases, talking about cron jobs, all these kind of things that they shouldn't really be caring about. This causes a feedback loop. This technical artifact will anchor themselves deeper and deeper in our model, in our language, and eventually it might even affect the operations. <coughs> 
how could we have avoided that? Simply by understanding that the ubiquitous language that we talk about in DDD is not about words, it's not about terms, it's about writing entire sentences. It's a full-on language. Here we define the sentence with the different stakeholders. We stack combustible in the chamber of the Columbiad, lower the projectile down the bore, and ignite the combustible. When we implement this feature, the code in our business logic layer should be this sentence, this full sentence, only this sentence. The code to place item at, the position, at a given position in the 3D space, it is some kind of business logic. But it's not the business logic that we are treating with here. It's not part of our model, it shouldn't be, and we should get isolated from that. Only when you have this clear model will you have a clear delimitation of your business logic layers and truly cohesive modules to implement it. And the good thing with that is that once your model becomes mature enough, once your language is mature enough, you will be able to just formulate a few sentences, tell them to your domain experts, and they'll tell you right away whether it's awkward, whether it works, and in a way, this is prototyping. This is the fastest and the cheapest way of prototyping that you could imagine. You just have a sentence, feedback right away on it, and potentially you save yourself days lost in implementing a bad idea. So now that we understand why the communication is so important, Let's use it to truly understand our domain. So we get back to the development. We start getting to a different phase where our projectile is already on its way to the moon. And here are some requirements that we get. A gunner tells us the target is moving at a speed of 2,300 miles an hour. The simulation stops once it is reached. An astronomer tells us the target is reached when the projectile has an acceleration of zero meter per second per second. We write exactly this. We get to the demo after maybe some weeks of programming. Our projectile is ejected. It's on its way to the moon. And the simulation stops before it reaches it. The domain experts are upset. The stakeholders are mad. Everybody is really upset and we don't truly understand what's wrong because we just implemented what was asked of us. So we start understanding there has been some miscommunication, misunderstandings, and that we should probably find a way of communicating better and uh, trying to have a deeper understanding altogether. A good solution for this is the event storming. It's a workshop format created by Alberto Brondolini to explore and map complex domains. This is not part of the Blue Book. This is not a tool in domain-driven design per se, but it's a very useful tool for us when we want to do domain-driven design at scale and to try and understand our entire system. So this will allow us to explore all of our system, the entirety of it. So it's a very long workshop. It can last a few days. And ideally, you do this with all stakeholders. Because knowledge is fragmented amongst all your stakeholders. The business, uh, the domain expert obviously has the most knowledge. But sometimes the developer has some that is hidden in some legacy part of your system of how we've been doing things. And truly, everybody has some bit of information about the system that no one else has. We want to avoid this, so we centralize and we share this knowledge thanks to the event storming. The reason it's called an event storming is because we start from the events up. Why not about the properties? Why not about the topology of our system? It's because domain-driven design is about process. It's about behavior. And events are a great symptom of this behavior. So now that we know what to do, we go and see the president of the gun club and we tell him 
I'll need to summon 15 software craftsmen, gunmen, astronomers, and ballisticians to play sticky notes on a wall for three days straight. It's very expensive to run such a workshop, and sadly, software development is still a young field. Software craftsmen are still seen only as executants, so our request is denied. In order to have our workshop anyway, we need to compromise. Maybe we don't have to understand the entirety of our system right away. We can focus on a subpart that is more important to us at this moment. This allows us to reduce it from a few days to a few hours. Maybe we don't need every single stakeholder for this. So we'll only invite the domain experts that are tightly linked to the scope we are exploring at the moment. And finally, because even this domain expert might not really want to come and lose their afternoon, we use the secret and ancient technique of the ambush. We lure them in with food and drinks. Hey, we need some clarification on a few topics. Let's use the occasion. We can meet, we can discuss a bit. We can have a few drinks, a bit of food. Usually it works. If they believe this is what their afternoon will look like, they're more likely to come. So now that we get everybody gathered, everybody eats a bit, everybody takes a glass of brandy, because after all, it's still a civilized time, so we don't serve soda in work meetings. We gather everyone around the blackboard, and we can get started. So we reduce the scope here to the execution of the simulation. We're not interested in all the addition process that happened before, in all the scene, in how we set up how much combustible, etc. We're not interested in the reports either. We just want to know what happens during the simulation and what we can observe. So everybody stands in front of the board and start placing sticky notes that represent domain events. So one of our software craftsmen plays this one first, combustible ignited. It's a legit domain event. Another one, gas expanded. A few more, projectile slow down, projectile ejected, projectile leaves the atmosphere, target reached. And we see our gunner coming towards the blackboard a little bit too enthusiastically. So here we start seeing a problem. There is a sticky note that we don't truly understand. So let's discuss it, let's try to understand what it's all about. So first, uh, who are the selenites? Oh, the inhabitants of the moon, all right. Um, when will they be blasted? When we reach the target, okay? Uh, the astronomer disagrees. So we discuss it a bit. And we start understanding that the astronomer didn't mean the moon when he said target reached. This is truly the source of our misunderstanding. For our gunner, target reached meant the projectile reached the moon. For astronomers, it meant the projectile reached the point where the gravity of the moon overcomes the gravity of the Earth. Target is a false cognate. It's one term that designates two different concepts. If it's not identified on time, it can lead to massive bugs. In our case, because we didn't have a deep understanding of what we meant by target, we are missing an entire part of our system. All the time in our simulation where the projectile is falling down the moon, we haven't been implementing it because we just didn't understand what target really meant. It's also very problematic in the code because even though now we start and realize that target means these two things, at no point in the code do we know what we're dealing with. If I have a variable named target or a class named target, am I dealing with the moon? or am I dealing with this point of equilibrium? Worse than this, we've spent days trying to get the right model for the target because we try to unify two concepts that have nothing to do with each other in one single class. So days of effort completely lost. The right thing to do is to disambiguate dis dis uh, dis and um, have a different terms for the different concepts. So for the moon, we'll simply talk about it saying the moon. And for this equilibrium point, we use the term in astronomy, the Lagrange point. 
Now it's impossible to get confused about these two in the code. Impossible to be mistaken, generally speaking, because you have truly two different classes, two different variables names, etc. So it will be much easier to implement it, but also to understand the specification as you talk. We change the post-it, replace it with Lagrange point reached. And it's also a great moment to get everybody aligned on the purpose of what we're doing. We're not trying to kill the inhabitants of the moon. We're trying to reach it somewhat peacefully. So how had we done this workshop before? If we had started with this, we would have saved weeks of wrong development with just a few hours of workshop to try and understand each other better. I think every developer had at some point to re-implement something because we misunderstood what the specifications were. And so communications to, uh, communication tools are very, very important when doing domain-driven design. We keep going on with our workshop. We organize our ticket, chronologically speaking. And um, we had comments. Here, run simulation. It's a new type of ticket, of sticky notes. And we will not explore further all the type of sticky notes that you can have in event storming. It can go pretty deeply. Here, the only thing we're trying to understand is what does this bring to the table for us? So if you want to know exactly how to run a session like this, I encourage you to go and check it online. So there's a lot of great resources on this. But here, we're just interested in this part. Instinctively as well, uh, as we organize them chronologically, we can start to realize that there are some clusters of tickets that have something to do with uh, different phases in our simulation. We have a moment where the projectile is leaving the Columbiad, and some events that are related to the moment where the projectile is on course to the moon. We don't know yet what to do with this information. We identify these two phases, but we're not exactly sure what to do with it. So we keep going back to our implementation. So now that we are implementing the right things, our model become more and more complex. And it's starting to, to get difficult to keep it efficient and to keep its integrity at every single point in the simulation. We're trying, in particular, to unify all the constraints that apply to the projectile during two different phases. On the left here, it's when the projectile is leaving the Columbiad. So we've ignited the combustible. It releases gas that expands, creating pressure on a projectile that will be compensated by air friction and uh, air resistance and some friction against the side of the bore. What matters to us here is the mass of the projectile, its diameter, its shape, the material it's made of, and on the other side, we're interested in uh, what's happening to the projectile when it's on its course to the moon already. So here we're trying to understand how fast it will slow. So what is the deceleration of our projectile as it travels? And this depends on the gravitational pull of the Earth and of the moon. So we're interested in the speed of our projectile, in its mass, and in its position in an axe from the Earth to the moon. Two different situations, two different constraints, one model. And in order to have it working in both of these constraints, we're starting to develop a complex understanding of physics, which takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, but is necessary in order to reconciliate these two situations. Worse than this, as we have more and more constraints, it takes even more computation, computational efforts and uh, our simple computers are not very fast. So we need to find a lot of uh, technical shortcuts, some tricks that we're very proud about, that are working in order to have our complex physics implemented. But when we draw it out like this, we, we just simply realize that we have two different problems. So why use a single solution that has to be so complex 
will be so much easier to have two simple, useful solutions to two different problems. We get back to the result of our workshop earlier, and now we start understanding what having two clusters of tickets mean. So we identified two limited problematics, the initial speed computation and the ballistic computation. At this point, we understand that we need two different models, but we're very reluctant to do so. We spent the last few weeks implementing complex physics, finding some great technical shortcuts and uh, some very interesting tricks, interesting tricks, and losing our time is not something that we're really happy about. So we're really tempted to keep what we have, make it work like this. But we've just lost this effort, we have to accept this fact, we have to move on and uh, avoid the sunk loss fallacy. What we need to understand too is that this model has been useful at some point, but it no longer is. It's outlived its usefulness because our situation has changed. Our problematic has changed and our solution should change as well. The only thing that truly matters is that we need to keep our model consistent and without contradictions. So let's try to see how we answer these problematics. First, we get back around the blackboard and we draw our domain. We keep talking about domain because it's about domain-driven design, but we haven't truly explained what it means. A domain is what an organization does and how it does it. We define limited areas of our domain that we call subdomain, our initial speed computation and ballistics computations. Then we map subsystem into our domain map. So here our simulator so far is answering both of our problem, so we write it in the middle. Sure, we want to cut it in half, we want to have two different models, but what matters is that we map the terrain not what we want to do with it. Because this kind of map that we pass informally around is what will guide us during our refactoring. So we do some refactoring, we extract the two problematics from the main system, and uh, it doesn't really matter how we extract them. No, we have two new systems that appeared, it may be microservices, it may be just monolith, uh, modular monolith uh, modules. The only thing that matters is that just we extracted them and we have them aside and independent. And uh, we can use this map to track our refactoring efforts because we can see that the simulator has shrunk. So it allows us to, to see the different sides of the system and uh, what's left to be done. So now two new models have truly emerged. And we talk of bounded context here. A bounded context is the limit of validity of a model. Since a model is a language, most and foremost, it's a linguistic boundary. We have sentences that are true within the ballistic context that will be false during the initial speed context, and vice versa. We can have two terms that means different things in both contexts. It doesn't matter. As long as each language doesn't contradict itself, both languages might not be compatible. And most importantly, when our domains are our problem space, the model and our bounded context are the solution space. There is not a single solution to a problem, so it's important to understand that how we split in bounded context is completely arbitrary. We should not be afraid to change it, we should not be afraid to find different solution and to have the split evolve. One problem that we have here is that we focus so much on our main model so that we're starting to have some code linked to the same editor in our three subsystem. When we change simple UX things, we have an impact across three different systems. It creates massive amounts of bugs. It's very complicated to keep this logic work working well and to have a consistent code and, generally speaking, to try and understand what we're doing. We realize that there is a new subdomain called the scene edition. We extract 
all the logic of scene addition toward a separate bounded context. And at this point, we realize that this bounded context doesn't really treat, doesn't address our main problematic. So it's different from what we already had. The initial speed context and the ballistic context are our core domain. These are the most important subdomains that we have. This is where the main value of our software resides, and this is where we focus our efforts. These are the right battle. And in order to focus our efforts correctly, we need to make them as small and manageable as possible. We need to remove all the noise from concepts that have nothing to do with the core value, with the competitive values that we bring with our software. It's also important that we keep refactoring them constantly. When our understanding changes, when we reach breakthrough in our understanding of the system, we want to have this breakthrough, this breakthrough repercutate in our code. So the more we will refactor them, the easier it will be to refactor and the more supple our design become. So what's important to understand is that we can't afford to make mistakes there, but we have to fix them. We have to keep these two core, do uh, core domains as close as possible to usefulness. On the other side, what we extracted is called the supporting domain. Supporting domain are domain subdomains that are non-critical to our problem. It's also important to understand that uh, the reason I'm using domain sometime to talk about subdomain is because these two terms are somewhat interchangeable. You'll hear both of them. It truly really depends on who is speaking and when. But in our current problem, when we check the scene editor, we have to realize that this is not a critical part of our system. What matters to send a, pro to send a projectile to the moon is that our computations are right. If the UX is a bit painful, too bad, it's not truly what matters the most. Having identified the most important part of our system is what allows us to escape the responsibility trap. It what allows us to understand that the entirety of our system will not be well designed. And that's all right. What needs to be well designed are the core system, the core domains. So when we have to spend extra efforts to isolate our business logic in this core domain. It might not be as necessary in the scene editor. We could use simple CRUD in the scene editor where we have to use advanced tactical patterns in our core domain. Because each bounded context will have an architecture that depends on its need. It's not really a good idea usually to try and uh, have the same architecture everywhere for all of this. So then we keep working with this. We have a notion of date that keeps happening when we do our computation of date and time. We implement it with our tactical patterns. It's uh, obviously a bit complex. It always takes time to implement these kind of things. And at some point we realize that we have time zone problem that we'll need to spend more time even refactoring our date. And we start to wonder like, what is so special about our dates that we need to implement it this way. We can just use a regular library. There's plenty of dates, libraries that work very well. So we identify a subdomain again. And unlike the scene editor, this is a generic subdomain. These are subdomains that are generic enough to use off the shelf system. We don't have any idiosyncratic needs regarding dates. We can just use a regular date library. So in practice, it's not critical to make a difference between generic subdomains and uh, supporting subdomain. I like to know when I can use uh, an off-the-shelf system. But other than that, you can just uh, go and identify what is not part of your core domain and extract them. Finally, on this map, we also want to represent the external systems. Here, we're not tracking the moon ourselves. It's way too much work. and Hopefully, the Cambridge Observatory is already doing this and exposing its, its uh, API. But still, we need to understand every problem that we have and to write down every solution that we have to this problem to keep tracking it. So at this point, we can also wonder, where does it stop? 
At which point do we stop breaking it? At which point do we stop extracting new contexts and new problematic? There is no true answer to this. There are pros and cons to large or smaller bounded context. The only thing that matters is that you find a way of keeping your model integrity without having too much work. Now that we identified this, we need to formalize the communication between our bounded contexts. The reason we need to do this is because first it has an impact on how you will implement it. The way your communication will run, you always have to make choices in what technology to use, in uh, which approach to use when communicating with other contexts. So this is really truly linked to the code. Secondly, it also impacts the interaction you will have with other teams. So you need to plan exactly how you will collaborate. So here, our first option when we communicate between the initial speed context and the ballistic context is to use the shared kernel. As we first split them, we have a single team that is working on both of these subsystems. So when they start splitting the code, we have a lot of terms, a lot of concepts that we keep using in both systems, so we don't have to duplicate and rewrite this code. We can just share it somewhere. We also have technical elements. So far, they've been sharing the same database, the same storage, for example. It's also part of the shared kernel. It's not only elements of the model. It's just important to keep track of what is shared so that we avoid modifying it without thinking of the consequences on the other context. So this means that our two contexts will be very tightly coupled. So obviously, this works better when you have a single team that is developing two different contexts. If you have two different teams doing it, at least you will need to concert every time you change anything in the short kernel. As our context and our model start differentiating more, and as they grow independently, we decide to have two different teams working on it. In order to separate this more, to reduce the overhead in communication, we move to a partnership type of relation. So a partnership will still demand a lot of collaboration. In example, you will define your APIs together, and ideally you will write automated tests with the two teams. So that you're sure when you modify your bounded context, you will not negatively impact the other team. This only works if both teams have to succeed together, if they have the exact same interest. Here, if the initial speed computation is working well, but the ballistic computation is not working well, we will not reach the moon. The opposite is true as well. Their interests are linked so they can have a partnership to make sure that both objectives are reached correctly. Our scene editor has some uh, things to say about the way the initial speed context is exposing its model as well. So they try to have the same kind of relationship. Except it's not as critical for us. If our scene editor is complex to work with, if the code is a bit dirty, if they have to find some workaround, if they're a bit late on stuff, it's not as critical as the success of the initial speed context and the ballistic context. They need to understand this. They need to understand that they will not be the priority of the initial speed context, and that they will only answer their demands if they have the bandwidth. So they cannot formulate demands. They have to formulate requests. We call this relationship a customer-supplier relationship. You have to know who is dependent on whom, and to understand that you will have to work around the asymmetry in the relationship. When communicating with our date library, however, at first we start to abstract from it. We don't want our core model to be too dependent on the definition of a date. But in the end, we end up having way too much work in developing this interface, in doing some facet patterns and etc. to just hide what's beyond it. And um, we keep using dates in the same way, so honestly, we can just accept the model of the target context 
the model of the date library as our own. This is a bit dangerous because it means that if we change our date library, if there is any change in its model, this will impact our core context. So this is called conformist relationship, and we have to use it only if we are aware of the risk. This is why it's so important to formalize this relation. It allows us to identify the risk we have and to keep track of it. Finally, when we are discussing with the Cambridge Observatory API, we need to realize that we have two very, very different models here. The Cambridge Observatory API, they talk in celestial bodies, they track the moon depending on its position in the solar system. Of course, we're just tracking it depending on the position in the sky. So we need the translation, and it makes more and more code for it. And at some point, if we're not being careful, we have element of the model of the Cambridge Observatory model that end up in our ballistic context. To avoid this, we build a new subsystem called an anti-corruption layer that will be aware of both our ballistic context model and the Cambridge Observatory model. And it will be dedicated to doing the translations. This is not to be mistaken with the ACL anti-corruption layer as a technical pattern that help us sometimes to isolate model from techniques and etc. Here we talk really of a strategy pattern that is used truly to understand and translate between model. When we write this type of map, we have to understand that we have to work around the Conway law. To paraphrase it, it says that an organization will design software that mirrors their communication structure. So know that we designed our software, know that we, want, we know how we want to communicate around it. We have to adapt our communication structure to this. It's not always possible as developer, we cannot always change the way the teams are organized. So when we can't change it, we have to choose the right type of relationship. For example, if you have two teams that work from different companies together, it's very risky to do a partnership. You have to understand that in software development, the interest and the strategy of companies can change fast. And so having your interest too deeply linked to the interest of a different company is a risk you're taking. It's better to go with something like a customer supplier relationship. So at this point, when we have a map like this, we've done all of our strategic design. We understand where is the core value of our context of our system. We understand where we have to spend our efforts. We made this core domain small and manageable enough. We know how we want to implement the communication. We know how we will interact with the team. We identified the risk. And more importantly, we understand the purpose of every subsystem and what we're trying to do. So now we understand, we'll understand easily which tactical pattern we want to use and how we want to use them. So in conclusion, start domain-driven design with your strategic design. This is what will allow you to avoid the wrong battle. This is what will allow you to focus on the important parts and to avoid exhausting yourself understanding tools that are really not adapted to your situation or from misusing them. You need to understand that your language and your model are deeply linked, that truly they are the same thing, and so that communication is extremely important. And finally, that the way you split your bounded contexts depends on your business needs. There's no right way to do this. If you need to evolve, your split will have to evolve as well. And there is no template to do that correctly. So don't be afraid of uh, iterating on your strategic choices just like you do with your tactical choices. And keep refactoring toward a deeper insight. Thank you very much. And if you have any question or any feedback, I'll be outside the room to discuss them. <laughs>